Lord, hallelujah, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for everything. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. We ask for forgiveness of our sins. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. Help us to walk in righteousness and obedience and in the light. May we follow hard after you. May we seek peace and pursue it. May we forsake all bitterness and wrath. May we cast off all works of darkness. May we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And may we love our neighbors as ourselves. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with the power to do it. For it's you who lives in us and abides in us, and we want to abide in you. For we can do nothing except we abide in you and you in us. May we bear much fruit for your glory. Our mouths are open wide. Please fill it with your truth. Fill it, Lord God. Hallelujah. For you said, if we ask, we shall receive. If we knock, you shall open. If we seek, we shall find. And right now we are seeking you diligently. And you said that you are a rewarder of those who seek you diligently. Here we are, Lord God, ready to receive like a little child. We're right before you, Lord God. You've invited us into your presence because of your amazing grace. We have boldness to enter into the throne room of glory by the new and living way which has been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we plead the blood for there's power in the blood. And we thank you, Lord God, for everything praying for the peace of Jerusalem in the name above all names, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. And today's teaching is just so amazing. It's, just, it's a lot of information. And so I asked the Holy Spirit to condense this information in a way that people will be able to understand it and grasp it because there's simplicity in the message. And the simplicity in the message is that the Bible tells the same story over and over and over and over and over again. The names of nations and peoples may change, but the overarching story is the same throughout. And the story that God is telling us in this teaching is in regards to 70 years, the kicking out of Satan, the fall of Babylon, and the cloudy day, which is all wrapped up into one event that happens on the day of sudden destruction. So let's get into this teaching so you can see this, okay? And... I started off by saying that the Bible tells us the same thing over and over and over again. And we see the same pattern played out in the story of Tyre and in the story of Babylon. In the story of Tyre, the Bible tells us in one chapter, the judgment of Tyre which is Ezekiel 27. This is the lament for Tyre. It's the, it tells us of the destruction. Then in the next chapter, Ezekiel 28, it's going to tell us a prophecy against the king of Tyre. And then it's going to tell us a prophecy about the kicking out of Satan. And then it's going to tell us um, a brief snippet of what happens during the tribulation, the great tribulation, and how Israel will be restored. And then... In another book, in Isaiah chapter 23, it tells us that um, when the fall of Tyre happens, it's related to when 70 years are completed. Okay, so that's the same story that we're going to get when we study the fall of Babylon. Okay, and in Isaiah chapter 13, we get the prophecy against Babylon. Okay, and then in the next chapter, we have the restoration of Israel. And then we have um, a, a prophecy against the king of Babylon. And then it switches to the fall of Satan. Okay, and then it talks about 
um, what happens during the Great Tribulation when the king of Assyria comes on the scene. Okay. And then in another book of the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 25, it talks about the 70 years that is connected with um, the fall of Babylon. So we see that God has hidden his word in his word. Hallelujah. You see, the Bible tells us that it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search it out. And so there's a pattern that God has given us. And it's in his word. Everything is in his word. And so what this teaching is going to show us is that the 70 years are upon us in our day and age. The 70 years is right on schedule with the 70-week prophecy in Daniel 9.27. The 70-week prophecy tells us that there's one week left. Okay, 69 weeks have been fulfilled. 483 years has been fulfilled. And that has been fulfilled twice. Okay, the first time it was fulfilled during the days when King Jesus first came. And then it was fulfilled again in 2018 when the 483 years is taken from the building of the walls of Jerusalem in 1535 by King Solomon when he ordered the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. 1535 plus 483 brings us to 2018. And right on schedule, the 70-year anniversary also happened in 2018. So God is pointing us to the completion of 70 years. And when the completion of 70 years comes, the Bible tells us in regards to the fall of Tyre and in regards to the fall of Babylon, that the devil will be kicked out of heaven, okay? And the day of the Lord will begin. And Tyre will be destroyed and Babylon will be destroyed, which are both types and shadows of that mystery that God has declared Babylon the great to be. Babylon the Great, which has the seventh king in charge at the time when she is destroyed. Okay, when mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth is destroyed. The Bible says that there will be a seventh king in charge of Babylon the Great at the time of her destruction. And in the fall of Tyre, we see a lot of interesting parallels to the seventh king over Babylon the Great. And so, um, before I get to the parallels with the seventh king over Babylon the Great, let us take a look at the lament for Tyre and how we can see that some of these descriptions, well not some of them, all of them, are in regards to modern day Tyre. Okay, modern day Tyre is America. Mo uh, modern day Tyre is a type and shadow of Babylon the Great. Okay, so when we read this lament for Tyre, God is pointing us to Revelation chapter 17 and 18, which is Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great is a mystery, but when we take the whole counsel of God and when we look at um, current world events, we can understand that everything that God describes about who Babylon the Great using types and shadows like Tyre and like ancient Babylon we can see that the same picture is being painted over only one nation that exists today. And that one nation that exists today, which has total control over the whole world, 
is the United States of America. And this teaching is going to show you those parallels. Okay, so we're going to start with the lament for Tyre. Uh, the lament for Tyre starts in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre. And uh, the lamentation for Tyre starts off with describing how Tyre was um, a sea-faring nation. Hallelujah. Verse 3. And say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situated at the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people, for many isles. Thus saith the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am perfect, I am of perfect beauty. Your borders are in the midst of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. Okay, so ancient Tyre. Okay, so ancient Tyre was this. This, this was ancient Tyre. It was uh it was um destroyed in 332 BC by Alexander the Great when he built this causeway from the mainland. Okay, so the mainland um, is located in modern day Lebanon. Okay, modern day Lebanon is where the mainland is at. And right off the coast was this little island um, which was Tyre. And Tyre was thought to be impregnable. And it couldn't be penetrated because no one could get to it until Alexander the Great came along. And Alexander the Great uh, built this causeway and he sent um, his fleet of ships to have a blockade for um, to stop supplies from going there. And he finally conquered um, ancient Tyre. OK, and because ancient Tyre was surrounded by water. Um, ancient Tyre was thought to, um, uh, it was thought to never, uh, be able to be conquered, but of course, um, it was conquered, which history tells us. Uh, and so God, um, is using ancient Tyre as a picture of, um, another nation, which is surrounded by the sea. And uh, that nation is none other than America. Okay, let me just show you this. Praise the Lord. If I could get to it. Modern day America is surrounded by the sea. Okay, you got the Pacific Ocean, you got the Gulf of Mexico, and you got the Atlantic Ocean. And it's also interesting how ancient Tyre kind of looks like the North American continent. You see, it kind of it kind of resembles it. You know, look at look at this. It kind of resembles the North American continent. You can see like Florida right here, the Gulf of Mexico. You got a little you got Mexico right here. And then, uh, you know, you got America right in here. And then you kind of got like Canada up here with the Hudson Bay. OK, uh, it, it's just it's just uncanny when you look at this and you really like see how. God, only God can do something like this, okay? Tyre was like a, a ancient, even in its physical um, layout, an, a, 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 an ancient model of modern-day Babylon the Great, which is also um, surrounded by waters, okay? Um, Babylon the Great sits upon many waters, and Babylon the Great uh, thinks that she can never be touched, okay, because no foreign army can get to her, okay? The waters have separated her uh, from a foreign invasion, so she thinks, okay? So she thinks, just like Tyre thought that um, she can never be breached, um, because no one could get to her until Alexander the Great came along and um, destroyed that notion. And so uh, let us get back to the teaching so we can get into more details. Hallelujah. In verses 5 through 9, the great ships that frequented um, Tyre, okay? Um, Tyre was known to have uh, many ships and people from all around the world 
the known world um, sailed in Tyre's navy. Okay, and this reminds us of Babylon the Great's navy. Okay, let let's let's look at let's look at some 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 facts. Um, this is an article from the National Interest. What are the five most powerful navies on the planet? Okay, so we just want to know what's the number one. United States. First place on the list is no surprise, the United States Navy. The U.S. Navy has the most ships by far of any Navy worldwide. It also has the greatest diversity of missions and the largest area of responsibility. Okay, so what makes the U.S. Navy stand out the most is its 10 aircraft carriers, more than the rest of the world put together. Okay. Not only are there more of them, they're also much bigger. A single Nimitz class aircraft carrier can carry twice as many planes, 72, as the next largest foreign carrier. Okay, so we see that the number one nation that has the most powerful navy on the planet is none other than the United States of America. Ancient Tyre was known for its navy. In verses 5 through 9, let's read it. They have made all your shipboards of fir trees of cedar. They have taken cedars from Lebanon to make masts for you. Of the oaks of Bashan, they have made your oars. The company of the Asherites have made your benches of ivory, brought out of the isles of Chittim. Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail. Blue and purple from the isles of Elisha, was that which covered you. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were thy mariners. Your wise men, O Tyrus, were in you, were your pilots. The ancients of Gebel and the wise men thereof were in you like caulkers. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to occupy your merchandise. Okay, so ancient Tyre was known for its navy, just as modern-day Tyre a.k.a. Mystery, Babylon the Great, is known for its navy. Okay, and let's continue. Verses uh, 10 through 11 talks about um, Tyre's army. Well, let's read this. They of Persia and of Lud and of Phut were in your army. Your men of war, they hang the shield and helmet in you. They set forth your comeliness. The men of Arvad with your army were upon your walls round about. And the Gamamins, the Gamadims were in your towers. They hang your shields upon your walls round about. They have made your beauty perfect. Okay, so uh, its army was stationed all around its walls. Okay, uh, its army um, also had foreign um, mercenaries, people from Persia and Lud and Phut. Lud and Phut were uh, North Africa. Persia, of course, is modern-day Iran. So um, ancient Tyre uh, was had a mingled people in it who served in its army. Okay, their men of war was, was a mingled people, just like Babylon the Great, just like modern-day Tyre. Okay, uh, the United States military is filled with people from around the world, okay, because Babylon the Great, modern-day Babylon, um, the United States of America is a country of immigrants. It's filled with mingled people from all around the world, and of course, America has uh, the most mightiest military on the planet. That goes without saying, um, and, but let's continue. Um, in verses 12 through 25, we see exactly what Revelation chapter 18 talks about. In these um, verses of Scripture, which I have highlighted in Ezekiel 27, verses 12 through 25, God describes all the things that were traded in Tyre by all these different um, nations. Okay, let's just read a couple of it, and then I'm going to show you some things. Uh, Tarshish was your merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches, with silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded in your fairs. 
Javan, Tubal, and Meshach, they were your merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in your market. They of the house of Torgarma traded in your fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. The men of Dedan were your merchants. Many isles were the merchandise of your hand. They brought you for a present horns of ivory and ebony. Okay, so it goes on and on and on to talk about everything that was traded in ancient Tyre. It's the same thing that happens with modern day Babylon the Great. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 12, it talks about all the merchants, all the merchants of the world who come to Babylon the Great to do um, their trade. Okay, and once Babylon the Great is destroyed, the merchants of the world weep over the destruction of Babylon the Great because no one buys their merchandise anymore. Uh, verse 9, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is your judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. Okay, and it goes on and on and on uh, to talk about everything that was traded in Babylon the Great. But when Babylon the Great is destroyed, the merchants of those things are crying out because no one can buy their merchandise anymore. Okay, so the question is, who is this Babylon the Great that does so much trade with all the nations of the world? Just as ancient Tyre traded with all the nations of the world. Ancient Tyre did all this business with all these nations across the world um, in antiquity, okay? And this is the same type of language um, that is spoken about in regards to Babylon the Great, which also does all types of trade with all the merchants of the world, with all the kings of the world. But once Babylon the Great is destroyed, the merchants of the world, the merchants of the earth, weep and mourn over Babylon the Great. Why? Verse 11, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. Okay, so whoever Babylon the Great is has to be a leading country that imports from around the world. So let's look at this. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at this. The world's leading import countries. When you import, that means that you're buying things from other countries. You're 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 the leading nation um, who who is buying other people's goods. Okay, so whoever's number one would qualify um, as being Babylon the Great, because once Babylon the Great is destroyed, according to the prophecy, the kings of the earth they weep and mourn over uh, Babylon the Great's destruction because. Um, Babylon the Great made all the kings of the world rich because she's the one who bought everything. Okay, she's the one who made all the kings rich um, and because Babylon the Great um, was filled with luxury. And Babylon the Great uh, uh, was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Uh, she had uh, very much money to do all this trade because Babylon the Great was rich. Hallelujah. And so let's look at what the, what the, what the statistics say. The world's leading import countries from the World Atlas. Who's number one? Statistics provided by the World Trade Organization in 2014 and published in April of this year indicate that the United States of America is the leading import country in the world 
garnering an import value of around 2.4 trillion in U.S. dollars. 2.4 trillion in U.S. dollars. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. Okay, that's amazing. Look at this. Um, popular import commodities. Top import products garnering the highest dollar value in terms of sale in 2014 included oil, with imports amassing a total of over 3 trillion U.S. dollars, along with a variety of mechanical, electronic, and medical equipment, each category of which billions, if not trillions of dollars. Vehicles imports also totaled over a trillion U.S. dollars in 2014. Other significant import products included gems, precious metals and coins, plastics, iron and steel products, and knitted or crocheted clothing, each with a measured uh, value in the billions. Okay, so uh, the number one leading import country is the United States of America. And the United States of America imports gems, precious metals, coins, plastics, iron, steel products, knitted and crocheted clothing. It's the same type of things that we read in Revelation, okay, uh, that Babylon the Great um, was a merchant of. Uh, they bought merchandise of gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are gems, okay? Gems and precious metals and coins, okay? Uh, that's the first thing that is said that Babylon the Great was a, was a merchant of, okay? And this was written thousands of years ago, uh, I mean, in 90 A.D., Okay, the merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and of pearls and fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet. Okay, that's the knitted and the crocheted work. Okay, um, knitted and crocheted clothing. Okay, that, that's what Babylon, uh, even in modern day, is, is, is said to be importing of, uh, Im importing the most of. Okay, and we know that many of... Uh, the clothes that we wear are imported from China and from other third world countries. We know that our shoes are imported from um, other countries that made them. Okay, America is uh, a merchant from uh, of, of, of goods from around the world. So just imagine if America was destroyed overnight, okay? Imagine if America was taken out in a single moment in one hour imagine if america was just wiped off the map in one day in one hour if this uh whole landmass was just totally obliterated by an all-out sneak attack um and then totally obliterated by god coming down from heaven upon the clouds uh, and then People around the world uh, would see the the smoke coming up from around the world because the world is darkened on this day. Could you imagine the wailing, the weeping that would occur if Babylon, the great, the United States of America was no more? Who's going to buy the world's goods anymore? Because all the world's goods were mostly imported by the United States of America, okay? Who's going to buy China's goods? Because America was the number one consumer of products made in China, okay? who Who's going to buy all of the world's goods when uh, all of the world's currencies have been totally destroyed because of the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, the two biggest stock exchanges in the world, were totally wiped off the map in one day and one hour. All the finances of the world, those Fortune 500 companies, everything has gone up in smoke. Everything has been burnt by fire. Okay. How will the world react if that was a reality? Would the world not react like the book of Revelation describes? Would not the world react like what we see here in the Bible? 
Verse 9, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her, and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas! Alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is your judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Okay? Would not the world react just like that? Would not the world react if Babylon the Great, which is America, was wiped off the map in one day and one hour? Wouldn't they not say what verse 16 tells us? Verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster, and all the company, and ships, and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas! Alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. My friends, this is what's going to happen. The Bible tells us that when Babylon the Great is destroyed, when that great city that sits upon many waters is destroyed like ancient Tyre was, those who were made rich by her will weep because all of their riches have gone up in smoke. Remember, the Bible tells us about the day of the Lord that in that day, the people will cast their silver and their gold into the streets. Okay, the silver and the gold will be worthless. Okay, there is no uh, need for silver and gold in the day of the Lord. Silver and gold is meaningless. Okay, look at this. They, 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 look, look at what the Bible says. Let me, let me pull this up. Um, cast their silver in the streets. Okay. Um, look at this. Ezekiel 7, uh, 19. Uh, and they shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither feel their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Okay. Zephaniah one eighteen also tells us the same thing about the day of the Lord's wrath. Uh, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Okay. Riches are worthless in the day of wrath. Okay. Uh, the Bible says that when this day comes, there's going to come a little horn who will appear if you're left behind. And he has a new way of living. <laughs> 
and that new way of living is called the mark of the beast. It's the cloudy day. And when he comes on the scene, uh, everyone who will not bow down to him, everyone who will not submit to him, everyone who will not take their mark in their forehead or in their right hand, the Bible says they will be killed, beheaded. Um, but praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ for all those in the tribulation who will not take the mark of the beast because the Bible says that they will save their soul for all eternity. But you see, the good news is that we can escape from that time of trouble. We can escape from that time of trouble. And the, the way that we can escape is by coming to Jesus Christ. And so when we come to Jesus Christ, we are not ignorant of the signs of the times because we are studying to show ourselves approved. And so let us get back to the teaching so we can continue to build the picture. How about um, Tyre and how Tyre is a type and shadow of modern day Babylon, which modern day Babylon, the great being the United States of America. And so we get to the destruction. This is back to Ezekiel 27. We still got a whole lot more to go, so let me keep on going. Um, Thy roars have brought thee unto great waters. The east wind hath broken you in the midst of the seas. Your riches and your fares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers, and the occupiers of your merchandise and all your men of war that are in you, and all the company which is in the midst of you shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of your ruin. The suburbs shall shake at the sound of the cry of your pilots, and all that handle the oar, the mariners, and all the pilots of the sea shall come down from their ships. They shall stand upon the land and shall cause their voice to be heard against you and shall cry bitterly and shall cast dust upon their heads. They shall wallow themselves in the ashes. That's exactly what happens when Babylon the Great is destroyed. We just went over some of it already. Um, the people who are left behind, who see the destruction of Babylon the Great, are throwing dust in the air. Um, they're uh, making themselves bald, okay? And they're, they're crying out um, for... Uh, the judgment that has come upon um, Babylon the Great, okay? Uh, when Babylon the Great is destroyed, uh, we see in Revelation 18, 19, um, this, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich, all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. That's the same thing that ancient Tyre, uh, what happened with ancient Tyre, which is also has a far fulfillment, which is fulfilled in the type and shadow, which she portrays in regards to Babylon the Great. Okay, and then we see, um, the scene that happens when the day of the Lord comes, everyone's bald headed, everyone's wearing sackcloth, verse 31, and they shall make themselves utterly bald for thee and gird them with sackcloth and they shall weep for thee with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. And in their wailing, they shall, they shall take up a lamentation for you and lament over you saying, what city is like Tyrus, like the destroyed in the midst of the sea? It's the same language with Babylon the Great. The people who lament over Babylon the Great, they say, what city is like unto this great city? Okay, what city is like unto this great city? This is Revelation 18, 18. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? It's the same thing that was said when Tyre fell. The people who saw it, they said, what city is like unto Tyrus? that was destroyed in the midst of the sea. When your wares went forth out of the seas, you filled as many people. You did enrich the kings of the earth with the multitude of your riches and of your merchandise. That's the same thing that Babylon the Great did. 
uh, Babylon the Great made um, the kings of the world rich through the abundance of her delicacies, okay? By the abundance of her delicacies, um, God has, I mean, Babylon the Great has made the whole world rich. This is verse 3 in Revelation 18. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Okay, so Babylon the Great has made everyone rich on the earth because um, Babylon the Great buys all these different things from around the world because Babylon the Great is the number one importing nation in the world. Okay, when you import, that means that you're buying commodities from all around the world. You're, you're spending uh, the money that you print in your country to buy goods that are produced in other countries and you're importing it into your country. So that means that Babylon is rich because she has the money to do it. She has the money to buy all these other goods from around the world. And the number one importing country um, in our day and age is the United States of America, which just so happens to look like um, ancient Tyre. Okay. Coincidence, right? Look at the United States. Look at ancient Tyre. Look at this. Okay. It looks just like modern day uh, America. Okay. The, uh, the North American continent. The Atlantic Ocean would be right here. The Gulf of Mexico would be right here. The Pacific Ocean would be right here. The Hudson Bay would be right here. That's Florida. Okay. And here's go Canada up here. Here goes America right here. And then here goes Mexico. Okay. Now look at modern day America. Gulf of Mexico, Florida, Atlantic Ocean, Hudson Bay, Canada, Pacific Ocean, Mexico. I mean, hey, <laughs> I, I mean, hey, I mean, what more can you say? What more can you say? Uh, verse 34. In the time when you shall be broken by the seas in the depths of the waters, your merchandise and all your company in the midst of you shall fall. All the inhabitants of the isles shall be astonished at you, and their kings shall be sore afraid. They shall be troubled in their countenance. The merchants among the people shall hiss at you. You shall be a terror, and never shall you be any more. Okay, so we saw the lament over Tyre. We saw how it's connected to um, the lament that happens when Babylon the Great is fallen. Okay, so we see the connection. And so let's go to the next chapter, Ezekiel 28, so we can see the connection to um, the seventh king over Babylon the Great. Now look at this. Praise the Lord. This is just so this is just so good right here. Look at this. This is amazing. I, when I was studying this, I just shook my head. Okay, this is verse one. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God, though thou set your heart as the heart of God. OK, now this just screamed of Donald Trump when I read it. OK, when I read it, this just screamed of Donald Trump because Don Don Donald Trump said that he doesn't even need to ask God for forgiveness. Okay, now look at this. Look at, look at, look at, <laughs> this is what he said. Now look at this. I'm going to play this for you. Uh, and now just listen to what Donald Trump said. This is straight from the president's mouth. Positive thinking, which is but, a great book. But have you ever asked God for forgiveness? <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think I, if I, if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. Now, when I take, you know, when we go in church and, and when I drink my little wine, which is about the only wine I drink, and have my little cracker, I guess that's a form of asking for forgiveness. And I do that as often as possible because I feel cleansed, okay? But, uh, you know, to me, that's important. I do that. But in terms of officially, I should, I see, I could say absolutely, and everybody... I don't think in terms of that. I, I think in terms of let's go on and let's make. Okay, now look at this. Here's, here's, here's when he came again 
on national TV uh, to rebuttal um, what he said. But he he look at what he says. Doing that very unethical. Well, let me ask you because one of the potential attack lines has to do with an answer you gave to Frank Luntz uh, months ago when you said that you've never asked God for forgiveness. Do you do you regret making that remark? No, I have great relationship with God. I have great relationship with uh, the evangelicals. In fact, nationwide, I'm I'm up by a lot. I'm leaving everybody, but I like to be good. I don't like to have to ask for forgiveness, and I am good. I don't do a lot of things that are bad. I try and do nothing that's bad. I live a very different life than probably a lot of people would think, and I have a very Always great I have now? a very great relationship with God and. I have a very great relationship with evangelicals, and I think that's why I'm doing so well with Iowa. The life you have now. Okay, so you heard it straight from Donald Trump's mouth. He says that he doesn't need to ask God for forgiveness. He says that he's good. He says that just by taking uh, the little wine and uh, you know, making a mockery of communion that he feels cleansed and that that's how he asks God for forgiveness. Well, the Bible tells us that in in so many ways, Proverbs 29 says this, uh, who can say I have kept my heart pure? Who can say that I am clean and without sin? Okay, that's exactly what Donald Trump was saying. He's saying, well, why do I need to ask God for forgiveness? Because I'm good. Okay, uh, he said that I, I don't... Um, need to ask God for forgiveness because I, I'm good. He said it out of his own mouth. Ecclesiastes 7.20 tells us this. Um, uh, for there is not a just man upon earth that does good and sinneth not. Okay, Jesus Christ said that there was none good uh, except for God. Okay, the only person who's good is God. Okay, but yet Donald Trump says that he's good. And so he doesn't think he needs to ask God for forgiveness. Okay, so the Bible tells us that if we say that we are without sin, um, we make God out to be a liar, and the truth is not in us. And so the point being is that when I was reading this, uh, uh, God says to to the king of Tyrus um, that the king of Tyrus believes that he's God himself. He doesn't need to ask God for forgiveness. Uh, God says that the king of Tyrus' heart is lifted up. Look at this, verse 2, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not God, though you set your heart as the heart of God. Okay, Donald Trump has done that. Okay, and look, and look what else, there's more. Look what else uh, he says, verse 3, Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from you. Okay, so God says that um, the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, believes that he's wiser than Daniel and that there's no secret that can be hid from him. Look at what Donald Trump said about that. He said that he's wiser than all the generals. Look at this. And I did too because I was getting killed in the press of saying I'm not, I know more about ISIS than the, the generals do, believe me. <laughs> and I did too because I was getting killed in the press of saying I'm not, I know more about ISIS than the, the generals do, believe me. Okay, so Donald Trump believes that uh, he's wiser than the generals, okay? It's the same uh, parallel with the king of Tyrus. God said of the king of Tyrus that uh, he was wiser than Daniel, so he thought, okay? Uh, he thought that he was wiser than Daniel and that there was no secret that can be hid from the king of Tyrus, okay? Because the king of Tyrus is lifted up with pride. That's the underlying message. The king of Tyrus is lifted up with pride. He believes that he's God. Uh, he believes that he's wise. Uh, and look at verse 4. Uh, with your wisdom and with your understanding, you have gotten you riches and has gotten gold and silver into your treasures, by your great wisdom and by your traffic, you have increased with riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. OK, now, isn't this look at look at this. Look at this. The, look at what Donald Trump said about his riches. Because I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I don't need anybody's money. I'm using my own money. I'm not using the lobbyists. I'm not using donors. I don't care. I'm really rich. I'll show you that in a second. And by the way. 
I'm not even saying that in a brag. That's the kind of mindset. That's the kind of thinking you need for this country. <laughs> I mean, you just can't make it up if you tried. I mean, it's coming out of his mouth. This, this is coming out of his mouth. L look at what God says about the king of Tyre. Okay, the king of Tyre believes that he doesn't need forgiveness. He, he's God himself. That's verse 2. The king of Tyrus believes that he's wise. That's verse 3. The king of Tyrus has gotten um, great riches. Okay, the, and we've seen how Donald Trump has uh, said all of these things out of his own mouth. He doesn't need forgiveness. He, he thinks that he's wise. He knows more than the generals. And he's rich. Okay, and God is painting the perfect picture of uh, the king of Tyre being fulfilled in the seventh king over Babylon the great. Okay, let's keep on reading. Verse 6, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon you, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, and they shall defile your brightness. They shall bring you down to the pit, and you shall die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Will you yet say before him that slays you, I am God? But you shall be a man and no God. In the hand of him that slays you, you shall die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it saith the Lord God. Okay, so we see that there's judgment coming upon the king of Tyrus. There's judgment coming upon the king of Tyrus, even though the king of Tyrus believes that he's God, yet God is going to judge the king of Tyrus. And so the king of Tyrus is um, a type and shadow of the seventh king of Babylon. Okay, and uh, we continue to read because now we get into the fall of Satan, okay, because this is all in conjunction with the fall of Tyre, okay? We read about the fall of Tyre here. The fall of Tyre was likened to Babylon the Great, and then there's a king over a Tyre, and the king of Tyre is also judged, okay, when uh, Tyre, um, the nation falls, okay? So the king of Tyre falls and his nation falls at the same time. And when that happens, God also judges the one who's behind, the spiritual power behind the king of Tyre. And the spiritual power behind the king of Tower, Tyre is none other than Hasatan, the devil. Look at this, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God. You seal us up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond. The barrel, the onyx, and the jasper. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle. And gold. The workmanship of your tablets and of your pipes were prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You were also upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created, until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You were corrupted by your, you were corrupted, uh, you have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It shall devour you, and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. All they that know you among the people shall be astonished at you. You shall be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. 
Okay, so we see that this is the casting down of Satan when the great war in heaven happens. We have to remember that um, the casting down of Satan happens in stages. When he first sinned, when he was walking up and down the midst of the stones of fire in the garden of God, um, when he was the anointed ch uh, cherub that covered, um, when he sinned in his heart, God judged him. Okay, and he fell from his position as the covering cherub. That's when Jesus said that he saw late, uh, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When that happened, Satan lost his position as the covering cherub, and he was cast down from that exalted position. But the Bible tells us that Satan has access to accuse us before the throne of God still. Okay, and we see that in Job chapter 1, when the sons of God come before the throne and the sons of God give a report to God himself. And the Bible says that Satan also comes among them. And then in the book of Revelation, it also tells us that um, Satan accuses us before the throne of God day and night. But there's going to come a time when the great war in heaven happens. And when the great war in heaven happens, Satan's access to accuse us before the throne of God is forever nullify Satan and all his demons Satan and all the fallen angels are forever kicked out of heaven never to enter there again and once that day comes um, a time of trouble will come upon the planet because Satan and all the fallen angels will be confined to the earth and uh, that all happens during um, the seven year tribulation and it happens on the day when the temple in heaven is open and Jesus Christ comes out of heaven. Uh, he comes down upon the clouds and at that very same time, the great war in heaven happens and Michael and the archangel wars against the dragon and his angels and Michael and his angels defeat the dragon and all the fallen angels and they're kicked out of heaven. And so we see that this is all tied into when Babylon falls because Babylon the Great is um, the type and shadow that is hinted at with um, Tyre. When Tyre is judged, um, the nation of Tyre is judged. The king of Tyre is judged. And then the power behind the king of Tyre, which is Satan, is judged. And this all happens in conjunction with the 70th year. And we see that here in Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23 is all about the fall of Tyre. And so here we see that Tyre will be judged when 70 years are completed. Verse 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years. According to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. Take in harp, go about the city, you harlot that, was, that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that you mayest be remembered. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. And she shall turn to her higher and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord, to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. So we see that um, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, okay? So we know that ancient Tyre was destroyed. Ancient Tyre was destroyed in 332 B.C. by Alexander the Great, okay? Um, this ancient Tyre has uh, been forgotten, okay? It's become a place for spreading nets. It's become like, it's been scraped like the top of a rock, which is exactly what the prophecy tells us in the Bible, okay? But because God is hinting at a far fulfillment, he's pointing us to the fulfillment of Babylon the Great being the fulfillment of um, this prophecy, Okay, uh, ancient Tyre is speaking about um, the far fulfillment of 
the mystery that is Babylon the Great. Okay, and because God is speaking to us um, through types and shadows with Tyre, he hints at how it will be understood because um, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years. Okay, so the 70 years is the clue. Okay, Tyre has been forgotten for 70 years according to the days of one king. Okay. The Bible tells us that that one king is the seventh king. Okay, Revelation 17. That one king is the seventh king. Okay, the seventh king who um, John said has not yet come, but when he comes, he must continue only a short space. This is Revelation 17, verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Okay, so um, the five who have uh, fallen were Alexander the Great. He was the first king. His four generals um, that took over make up the one plus four is five. By the time John had written this, all five of those kings were dead. The one who is was Caesar, who was in charge in 90 AD. Okay, and then the other who has not yet come is the seventh king. And when the seventh king comes, he must continue a short space. And it's the seventh king that will be in charge of Babylon the Great when it falls. Because after Babylon the Great falls, there comes an eighth king. Verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. Okay, so the beast, okay, who comes after Babylon the great is destroyed, the little horn, okay, the beast that was and is not. He is the eighth king who comes on the scene after Babylon the great is destroyed, okay. He is the antichrist, the little horn, okay. But at the time of Babylon the great's fall, it's the seventh king that is in charge. And it's the seventh king that we read about here in Isaiah chapter 23, Okay, when Tyre is forgotten for 70 years. Okay, we're in the 70th anniversary of Israel. Okay, we're in the 70th anniversary of Israel. It's been 70 years now. So God is cluing us again to the number 70. And now, because we're here in the 70th year, okay, um, the king over Babylon, okay, who was also the king of Tyre, okay, in types and shadows, he was 70 years old, seven months and seven days when he took over, um, um, when he took office. Okay, Donald Trump, look, Donald Trump, he was born June 14th, 1946. He took office on January 20th, 2017. We calculate the day, his birthday, June 14th, 1946, to the day he took office, January 20th, 2017, we get... 70 years, seven months, seven days. He's the seventh king. Okay, the number seven is all around Donald Trump. That's just one example. He was um, in charge during the time when Israel celebrated its 70th anniversary. He was the president. He was the president who uh, moved the United States Embassy to Jerusalem on the anniversary date of May 14th, 2018. He was the president who declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, okay, uh, December last year, 2017, okay? And here we are in the 70th year of Israel being a nation again. And the Bible tells us that Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, okay? But when the 70 years are upon us, according to the days of one king, that seventh king, hallelujah, um, the Bible says that Tyre will sing as a harlot. And when Tyre sings as a harlot, the Bible says that God is going to come and visit Tyre. Look at verse 17. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. And she shall turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Okay, so... The Bible tells us that when God comes to visit Tyre, he's coming to inspect. 
He's coming to inspect what's been going on with Tyre. Okay, for 70 years, God has been silent, according to the days of one king. Okay, according to um, the 70 year uh, that Israel has been a nation again, okay? We're in the 70th anniversary, and the seventh king over Babylon the Great is in charge. And now God is going to come and visit Tyre, meaning God is going to come and visit Babylon the Great. And when God comes to visit Babylon the Great, this is what he sees. He sees that Babylon the Great, okay, which is what he's talking about here, but, you know, it says Tyre. I hope you're following along. Okay, when God comes to visit Tyre, he sees that Tyre has gone back to her old ways. Just as ancient Tyre committed fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. When God comes to visit Tyre, when the 70 years are complete, he sees that Tyre has gone a-whoring just like she did in ancient times. Okay, Tyre hasn't changed. Tyre is still the same. Tyre has still um, committed whoredom, just like Babylon the Great, which is what God is hinting at, which is what God is speaking about. Okay, because when God visits, when God comes down to inspect, he sees that Tyre has done what she's always done. She's opened up her legs and spread out her legs to everyone under the sun. And she's committed fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. This is the, the exact same language that we get in um, the book of Revelation. Okay. Um, in Revelation 19 too, uh, when the saints of God, when the body of Christ is raptured um, to the father's house, we are rejoicing in heaven over the destruction of Babylon the great. And we say for true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Okay, so when we go to heaven, because the rapture is connected with the fall of Babylon, the rapture is connected with the fall of Babylon, uh, we rejoice over her destruction, uh, and we rejoice because God has judged this great harlot, who has prostituted herself with all the kings of the world, okay? Babylon the Great has um, fornicated with all the kings of the world, okay? And the Bible says in Revelation 18.3, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Okay, so Babylon the Great has committed harlotry, just like the Bible says of um, Tyre, that uh, Tyre has committed harlotry and God comes to visit Tyre when 70 years are completed, verse 17, and it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. And she shall turn to her higher and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Okay, so we see the same parallel. Okay, I, I pray that you have gotten the picture, you know, um, the 70 year connection. And um, while I'm going to end this teaching now, this, like I said at the beginning of this teaching, this same pattern exist with the fall of ancient Babylon. Let me just show you this real quick. Isaiah 13, it talks about the destruction of Babylon, ancient Babylon. Okay, the next chapter, Isaiah 14, talks about the restoration of Israel, talks about the destruction of the king of Babylon, and it talks about the power behind the king of Babylon, which is Satan. And then it talks about what happens during the cloudy day with the king of Assyria. Okay, the king of Assyria is uh, the Antichrist, okay, the Assyrian. Um, and then in another book of the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 25, it equates when all this happens uh, to 70 years, okay. Um, when the 70 years are completed, God will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. 
and he's going to bring everything that he has written about in the book of Jeremiah and everything that he has prophesied against all the nations to pass. So um, again, the 70 years are, are attached um, just like we went over today um, with the same order of events in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 27 talks about the judgment upon Tyre. Then Ezekiel 28 talks about the judgment upon the king of Tyre, and then the judgment upon the power behind the king of Tyre, which is Satan. And then it talks about um, the restoration of Israel and what happens during the cloudy day. Okay, I didn't really go over it, but let me just hit this right quick. The prophecy against Sidon. I, I ended with um, the, oh, I, yeah, I ended with, um, you know, talking about the power behind the king of Tyre, which was Satan. And then I skipped over to how it's all connected to um, the 70 years. Okay. Um, but I forgot to talk about what happens after. Okay. During the, during the cloudy day, during the cloudy day, we, we get a little snapshot in Isaiah, Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28. Um, after it talks about the power, the judgment of the power behind the king of Tyre, which is Satan, it talks about what happens during the cloudy day. And it, it it's um, spoken about and against a, 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 with a prophecy against Sidon. Okay. A prophecy against Sidon. Sidon was under the control of the Assyrian Empire. Sidon is, of course, in uh, modern-day Lebanon. And so the Assyrian is also hinted at in this prophecy. And uh, God says he's going to judge um, uh, the Assyrian. He's going to send pestilence and blood into the streets of Sidon. He's going to execute judgments, okay? And then he talks about how um, Sidon will not be any longer a pricking briar unto the house of Israel, nor a grieving thorn to all who are round about him. We know that briars, pricking briars and uh, thorns are um, synonyms of um, the power of the wicked one, okay? The devil and his angels, okay? Uh, the pricking briar and the thorn is, um, you know, synonyms for the Antichrist and the false prophet who will be on the scene. But God is going to destroy uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan. Okay. And then we get the restoration of the house of Israel. Okay. When all this happens. Okay. The restoration of the house of Israel is mentioned that in verses 25 and 26. And so the point being is that it's the same order. It's the same pattern. Um, when, that I just showed you with Babylon, okay, that same pattern, okay, that we just went over with Tyre, and it's all linked together with the 70 years, and when the 70 years are completed, judgment comes upon the planet, and it begins with uh, the casting down of Satan from heaven, and the judgment upon the ruling power at that time, which the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation 17 and 18 is Babylon the Great, okay? And that world order is destroyed, and it all happens on the cloudy day. And so uh, if we're ready, we'll be caught up when that day comes. It's known as the day of sudden destruction. But if we're not ready, we'll be left behind. And, uh, you know, you're liable to die if you're left behind on that same day because when that same day comes it's it's a lot of destruction that comes on that day and there's no chance that you would even survive it okay because there's going to be many dead bodies in every place but if you do survive it you know you've uh god has given you grace because whew, if you get caught up in the cloudy day judgment my goodness i mean there's just you're you're lost forever you're going to the lake of fire I just can't imagine such a terrible fate. I just can't imagine it. You know, I can't imagine being lost forever. You know, it's just, it just hurts your your heart, you know, to think about it. You know, to be lost forever, you know, just to be lost forever. You know, to be subject to the fiery flame forever. 
uh, just is just frightening just to think about. But sadly, many people will be lost on that day. I mean, many people have already been lost. I mean, we're at the end of human history now. I mean, you know, the 6,000 years are upon us. This is the end of the age now. How many countless billions people, billions and billions of people have lived before us? I mean, how about all the people who lived in the days of Noah? I mean, just imagine how many people were on the planet back then because the people lived to be, you know, hundreds of years old back then. Just imagine all those people, you know, all those people that were swept away, and that died even before the flood, who were godless. And then from that time on, after the flood, all the people who have lived, you know, up into our present time who died without God. I mean, just... <laughs> I mean, it just, it's just, it's innumerable. I mean, of course, God knows the number, but it's just, it's just terrible to think about. All these people who have rejected the Holy One of Israel, all, the, all these people who have gone astray and a whoring after other gods who will be forever lost in the lake of fire. And then you just look out in our world today and you see how lost it is. The world has gone mad. Babylon the Great. It has been instrumental in uh, pushing godlessness throughout the world. The whole world has become drunken with the fornication of Babylon's intoxicating wine. Okay, Babylon has a golden cup in her hand. It has made all the world drunken. Therefore, uh, God says the nations are mad. Okay, because what has Babylon done? She's polluted the whole world with her filth. Hollywood pumps out mu movies after movies, you know, you got music, okay, that pumps out godless stuff day after day, moment after moment, centered here in America, in Babylon. Then you got pornography uh, that uh, shows fornication, unparalleled, and all types of wicked, abominable acts uh, that, you know, <laughs> Is beyond comprehension. And then you have sodomy, you know, sodomites, gay pride. It's just, it's just crazy. Oh my goodness. And then you hit, then you got, then you got, you know, the countless wars and the proxy covert things that Babylon the Great has done, you know, to, to, to I mean, I mean, it's just a laundry list. I mean, I mean, you know, it's just it's just madness and then you just look out in the world and if you travel the world you talking to other people you see that many other people around the world they're envious of babylon they want the freedom that america has and they they try to emulate american culture you know they they want to dress like american people you know they want the freedom the liberty you know and then uh, uh, nations who hate America, they call America the great Satan, you know. And, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, I'm going down a whole nother rabbit trail, but you get the point. I mean, but now we're at the end. The 70 years are here. That's the point. Um, Lord willing, I could come back and do the teaching upon Babylon, which is the other parallel to Tyre. You know, I kind of hit it in my last teaching with the sign of the Son of Man, and I kind of went over some things today, but it's a whole nother lesson because there's a whole lot in Jeremiah 25, um, which highlight the 70 years and its connection to Babylon, because it also talks about the judgment of the whole of all the other nations of the world. And it's just a whole lot, but I pray that this teaching was clear, that it was edifying. If there's anyone out there who doesn't know you, King Jesus, we pray that their soul would be saved because the time is short, the days are evil, and you're about to come. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Believe in your heart that he has risen from the dead and you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God will take the stony heart that you have and give you a heart of flesh. He'll give you new life. Write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and you will live forever. Your sins will be forgiven as far as the east is from the west, but the choice is yours. So come to him today and you'll live forever. Don't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow might not come. And as you can see with this world, this world is going to hell, okay? 
The cloudy day is upon us. Not much time left. We have to be ready because the day of the Lord is at hand and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Your hands will faint and your heart will melt if you're left behind. So don't be left behind. Give your heart to Jesus Christ and be caught up. Welcome into the Father's house and called a child of the Most High God forever and ever. I love you. God bless you. King Jesus is coming. Amen.